Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Objective C Memory Management course. Uh, my name is Steve Saunders. I work at the ARC Centre of Excellence in Cognition and its Disorders at Macquarie University. So uh, I assume you're all kind of new to OS, iOS development if you're coming to this, yeah, okay. Welcome to the fold. Uh, so quick synopsis of what we're going to talk about. First we're going to start by looking at what memory is quickly and what memory management is all about. Uh, then we'll take a quick look at uh, reference counting which is Objective-C's memory management system. We'll look at uh, garbage collection, another memory management system. Uh, we'll take another quick look at reference counting and we'll finish up with uh, using some tools for fixing memory bugs, how to find and fix them with some cool Apple tools. So let's get started. Uh, what is memory? Well here's some memory. Uh, now if you're a hardware engineer you might need to think about dynamic RAM refresh timings or something like that, but that's not the kind of memory management we're interested in. And uh, I like this cartoon as a way of depicting what memory looks like to us programmers. This is titled Night in the City of Bytes. Each house represents a byte and they continue on into the distance. There's eight lamps representing bits at, uh, on every house. So that's what memory looks like for us. So memory is made up of bytes. Bytes are the basic addressable element of memory. They're made up of bits and bits are either on or off so bits are the simplest memory element. And so how do we manage this stuff? Well let's take a quick look at the history of memory management or an evolution of memory management. And we'll start in the 8-bit era. This is, uh, this is the type of computer that was around when I first started programming. I have the Apple IIe there, I played with a few of them. The Commodore 64 in the back right, that's uh, according to the Guinness uh, Book of World Records, it's the most popular computer model ever. And in the front there we have the Atari 600XL, that's the first computer I ever programmed on. All of these computers were based on the Moz 6502 CPU or microprocessor and uh, they were clocked at staggeringly high speeds for the Apple IIe and C64. You were looking at about 1 megahertz and a bit more for the Atari so at least I had bragging rights. And the 6502 had a staggering 64 kilobytes of addressing space uh, which is not very much. Let's just have a quick look at how much that is. In comparison, the iPhone has 512 megabytes, the iPhone 4, that's more than 8,000 times as much. So how did we manage memory when we had such a small amount of memory to work with? Well here's uh, Hello World in uh, 6502 assembly language for the 8-bit uh, Atari. And uh, the way this program works is that uh, uh, at address hex 340, uh, which the dollar sign denotes a hexadecimal number there, so uh, there lived a thing called an I.O. control block. And what we're doing is we're populating that I.O. control block with the information necessary to send our Hello World message to the screen. And at the bottom we jump into a ROM routine located at uh, near the top of memory, which actually performs the I.O. operation. Now the top line of that program is not actually an assembly language instruction. It's a directive to the assembler telling it where in memory that your program code should go. And uh, you could pretty much s send your code anywhere you like. Uh, and you could read and write anywhere you like in memory. But there were some caveats. Some places were off limits. And we'll have a quick look at the memory map uh, for the Atari 8-bit and uh, see what that looks like. So the first place that was off limits was the system stack. The 6502 hard-coded the system stack to, to what was called page 1, which is the addresses between 100 and 1FF hex. And uh, when, whenever you invoked a uh, subroutine with the, like the JSR call there, the return address uh, or the location of the following instruction was pushed onto the system stack so that when an RTS uh, instruction was reached, it would know where, to, where it needed to go back to. So if you tried to tell your assembler to put your code uh, in between those two addresses, it would quickly get overwritten when you made function calls, so you couldn't use that area of memory. Another area you couldn't use was up here. Depending on the graphics mode you're in, uh, the 
that region might have slightly different addresses, but the standard graphics mode had those addresses. So you couldn't put your code there because it would all show up on the screen. Uh, another important factor was the zero page. Now, uh, certain instructions for accessing memory had a uh, different opcode if you were accessing memory in zero page. And what that meant was that because the opcode was only for zero page, you only needed one byte to encode the address rather than two, which would, you would normally need. And therefore, that instruction could be loaded faster. And therefore, instructions using zero page were faster. And for that reason, lots of uh, bytes in the zero page were used by the system for various functions. So you couldn't overwrite those values unless you wanted things to start breaking. Uh, interesting story about uh, this 6502 stack. When uh, Microsoft first started, they uh, started out doing a basic interpreter for the Altair. Has everyone heard, heard about that? The Altair was kind of the first PC. It was based on the Intel 8088. And uh, that's how Microsoft got started, doing a basic interpreter for that system. And one day, someone at Microsoft translated their uh, basic interpreter to 6502 machine language. And when Bill Gates heard about it, he thought this was a stupid thing to do because he didn't like the stack on the 6502. So he told the programmer to just get rid of it. And as a result, Commodore, which owned Moz Technology, which was the creator of the 6502, and were inventing their PET computer, managed to get a really sweet deal on Microsoft Basic. They paid uh, only a few thousand dollars for it, I think, for a perpetual license, which they then repeatedly reused in their later models of computers. And that's probably one of the only times someone got the best of Bill Gates in a business deal. Uh, OK. And there were, of course, many, many other uh, locations you couldn't use. Near the top of memory, uh, that, w that area was mapped to ROM, so you couldn't start putting things in there, and many, many more. Um, so how could you tell where you, need, where you could use and where you could put your code and, and uh, not get it wrong? Uh, well, the, what you did was you got a book. And I actually have the Atari book here, if anyone wants to come and check it out at, at the end of the scene. It's quite a thick book. Uh, it's really a lot of information you need to know to manage memory back, back then, even though we had such a tiny amount of memory. Fortunately, things have progressed since then. And we'll look at uh, memory management in plain C. So you get your memory organized into two sort of distinct important kinds for you. I mean, in C, you can still directly address memory if you want. But uh, modern systems won't allow you to overwrite other processes, memory and stuff. So what you're really working with is two different kinds of memory. And the first is the stack. Now, stack is a last in, first out uh, kind of thing. So we'll see the last thing in is the first thing to go out. And as we said before, the stack is where return addresses for your subroutines are, are stuck and also your function arguments and your function local variables live on the stack. Uh, the other kind of memory is the heap. Basically, the system sets aside a, a pile of memory for you called the heap. And whenever you ask for some dynamically allocated memory, that's where the memory comes from. It comes from the heap. So in C, you allocate with malloc, or there's several uh, functions in the malloc family, like C alloc and stuff. And when you're finished, you return the memory to the heap by passing the pointer to the memory block into the free function. So uh, let's have a quick look at a uh, C function here. So we have a couple of uh, local variables and some uh, malloc memory. So the integer there is probably going to be four bytes, depends on, on your system. Uh, the uh, character pointer there, that also lives on the stack, and uh, that is eight bytes on a normal Mac at the moment. Uh, the allocated memory comes from the heap, and we return it with free. And once we leave the scope of the function, the stack frame gets popped, which means that I and string no longer exist. Now, the, the memory is still there, and it still contains the same values that it used to, but it will get overwritten by the next stack frame, so you, you need to be careful about it. Now, what would happen if we forgot to free the uh, area memory we malloced? Well, in that case, when the stack frame was popped, we'd lose I and string, and then we'd no, have no pointer to that memory anymore. And that would mean that we couldn't call free to release that piece of memory. 
and that's what's called a memory leak. The memory is now tied up, it's not in the heap anymore, it's tied up, and, uh, but we don't have a pointer to it so we can't free it, so it's lost. All right, now here's another function. Anyone want to have a guess at what would happen if we did this? All right, so what would happen is that uh, the integer pointer that we got back from calling our, our function would point to a location that came from the stack. So initially, the value that it points to would be whatever we expected it to be. But after a little while, some other stack frame would have overwritten that value and uh, the, even though the pointer points to the same location, the value it points to has changed out from underneath us, and so that's a bug. All right, a couple of quick points about the heap. In Objective-C, all objects are allocated from the heap. You can't have an object on the stack. You can have an object pointer on the stack, but not an object. Now, that contrasts to something like C++. You can have objects on the stack in C++, but not in Objective-C. The exception to that is blocks. Blocks are created initially on the stack, and that's why uh, you may have heard, if, has anyone heard about blocks? Does everyone know what blocks is? Yeah? So blocks are created on the stack, and uh, if you, so if you want to keep a block around after you leave the scope in which they are created, you need to copy them, and you can treat a block like an object, so you can send a copy message to it, and that will create a copy on the heap. All right, so we've arrived at object-oriented memory management. Uh, now, your objects obviously live uh, in memory, so we need to manage that memory, and so object-oriented memory management is about managing the life cycle of objects. Um, if you need to allocate non-object memory, you still do that with malloc, or maybe a file pointer you create with file f open or whatever. Uh, and if you need to manage that, what you can do, a good, good trick for dealing with uh, non-object memory is to stick it in an object, uh, manage the object like you do your other objects, and in your object, when your object is being destroyed, then you free the resource. And then that, that allows you to treat other kinds of uh, resources in the same way that you treat objects. Uh, now, there are two simple rules for object-oriented memory management. First one, always free objects when they are no longer needed. If you don't do that, there'll be a memory leak, there'll be wasted space. And if you do that a lot, you'll have a lot of wasted space, you'll start degrading system performance and stuff like that. And the second rule is don't free objects prematurely. Otherwise, you get all kinds of really hard to figure out bugs and lots of problems. So these two rules sound like pretty simple. Uh, you know, uh, someone once went to a wise man and said, how do I succeed in the stock market? And the wise man said, couldn't be easier, buy low, sell high. Now who thinks that now that they know those two rules, they can succeed in the stock market? Right, <laughs> I don't think so either. And the reason is because although the rules are simple, following the rules is not simple. And the reason for that is because when your program starts to get complicated and your class diagram starts looking like this, it's really hard to figure out how to obey those two rules. And I like this summary here that uh, I found somewhere on the web. Memory management is a simple concept, but is complicated by the interconnected nature of object-oriented programs. It may be difficult to determine when an object is safe to delete. All right, so how do we solve this problem of knowing when it's safe to delete objects so we can delete them when we're supposed to and not forget to do it? Well, the solution in Objective-C is called reference counting. Uh, so we'll take a look at reference counting. Uh, every object has a count of its, the number of owners it has. So NS object, give, every object in Objective-C inherits from NS object, and NS object in, implements all this stuff, so you have a retain count in every object. Uh, let's call it its retain count. Every time an object acquires a new owner, you increase its retain count by one. And when it loses an owner, you decrease it by one. And when the retain count hits zero, that means <coughs> there are no more owners for your object and your object is immediately returned to the heap. So it's deallocated and sent back to the heap. Okay, so we'll look at an example here. We have three objects and the house object is, has a retain count of two because it has two owners, a mortgagor and a mortgagee. And uh, if we imagine the mortgagor finishes repaying their mortgage, 
ha, like that's ever going to happen. Uh, the mortgage E loses interest, so the retained count goes down to one. Now, if the uh, owner of the house dies and no one else takes it up, it's going to fall apart eventually, overgrowth and all the rest. So we'll imagine the mortgage had died. That means the retained count goes to zero and the house disappears. So how do you acquire ownership of an object? Rule number one, if you build it, you own it. So if you create an object and you create it with functions like alloc and new or anything that begins with alloc or new, then you are the owner and the object will arrive to you with a retain count of one. Uh, and there's an example there. Uh, also, copy and mutable copy, or pretty much any uh, method containing the word copy, uh, also makes you the owner. Uh, if you didn't create the object, you don't own it. And if you don't want it to be returned to the heap out from under you at some random point in the future, you need to acquire ownership yourself. And the way you do that is by sending the message retain. So we've acquired an object here, but the uh, method we use to get it doesn't start with alloc or new and doesn't contain copy. So we get back an object and we don't know what its retain count is, but we need to retain it if we want to make sure it doesn't disappear. So we do that by sending retain. A uh, neat thing about retain is that uh, it actually returns the pointer that you uh, retained. So you can nest retain inside our other statements. And we'll see an example of that soon. Uh, now, once you're finished with an object, you have to obey the rules. You have to forfeit ownership. And the way you do that is by sending the release message. And there's an example. So we start with an unknown retain count. We send release, and that retain count will, re will be reduced by one. And if that means the retain count hits zero, then the object will be destroyed immediately. So you don't want to do that if you still need the object, obviously, or someone else still needs the object. So the rules for forfeiting ownership. You must release it if you own it, and you must not release it if you don't own it. Pretty simple. So sometimes you'll see uh, some people do a trick where what they'll do is they'll do a loop which checks what the retain count of an object is and then keep sending it releases until it's zero. That's, that's really bad. If you find yourself doing that, then you have failed <laughs> at your program design. You should be, your object should be doing, managing their ownership properly so that you don't have to do that kind of hack. Now, uh, if you have created an object with IVARs uh, that you need to release uh, once your object disappears, you do that in a, what's called the dialloc method. The dialloc method is sent to your object when its retain count reaches zero, so it can do any cleanup it needs before its memory is returned to the heap. Uh, so you override NS objects uh, or whatever class you're inheriting from uh, implementation of dialloc, which means you need to call super dialloc so that if uh, the super class needs to do any cleanup, it gets to do it as well. Uh, and there's an example of a dialloc method. All right, so there's a couple of problems that show up with what we've learned so far, and here's one of them. We have a function here that returns a string. Um, we allocated that string, so we own it, and we're responsible for releasing it at some point. Uh, we never did in this implementation, and the method name doesn't start with alloc or new, and doesn't contain copy, so the person who called this function is not going to expect that they own the object. And therefore, if they want to keep the string, they're going to retain it and, and then release it, which means the uh, retain count from our allocation is never going to be uh, released. But we can't release it ourselves, because if we did that, the object would be destroyed before we returned it from our function. So how can we solve this problem? What we need is a friend. And if we could just say to this friend, can you send result a release sometime just a little bit in the future? Uh, and fortunately for us, uh, Objective-C provides a uh, friend for us, and that friend is called the NS Auto Release Pool. Uh, now, you put an op uh, object in the Auto Release Pool with Auto Release, um, and when the pool gets destroyed, all the objects in the pool will receive a release message. So this is your way of saying, I need to send this a release, but it needs to happen a bit later. 
Now, when's later? Uh, the app kit will, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot that. Uh, if you put an object in multiple times, it will get multiple releases, so it's safe to do that. Uh, the app kit will create an uh, auto release pool for you at the beginning of every cycle of the event loop and then destroy it at the end of that cycle. So every time you handle an event, a new auto release pool is made for you to stick auto release objects in and it's destroyed at the end of the uh, event. So all your event handling code can just auto release objects freely and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, now, sometimes that's not good enough. You may, maybe you're creating a lot of auto-released objects and it's really it's tying up a lot of memory uh, before the end of the event loop. So in that case, you can uh, create your own uh, auto-release pools. Now, this is a liability of using mirror display and not having my notes handy. Uh, every thread has a stack of auto-release pools. Uh, so they, every time a new one's created, it goes on top of the stack and auto-release objects are put into the top pool and then when that pool is released, it goes away and whatever pool's underneath will start receiving auto-release objects. Uh, here's how you create your own. It's pretty standard uh, object creation uh, syntax there. And that's how you destroy one. Now you could also do a pool release. That would, uh, that would do the same thing in memory managed code, but in garbage collected code, it doesn't. So always use pool drain. And you're probably wondering why you'd want to have garbage collected code using NS auto release pools. You probably don't, so you can just forget it. But just always use pool drain. Uh, you can never retain a auto release pool. That's why releasing an auto release pool destroys it. Uh, if you try and retain it, you'll get an exception. <coughs> and the reason is because the idea of an auto release pool is you should be creating it and destroying it in the same context. So that's the same function or loop body or something like that. Uh, so, the solution to our problem earlier is to send an auto-release before we return our result. Uh, so, this, this uh, highlights a thing called convenience methods. Uh, our pirate name method is like a convenience method. These are things that create objects for you but don't confer ownership automatically. And an example of that is NS string string with format. It doesn't start with alloc and it doesn't start with new and it doesn't contain copy. So you don't get ownership of that object when you call this function. Uh, and it, the way that works is that the uh, string that's returned to you has been auto-released. So um, this is roughly equivalent to calling init with format with the same arguments and then auto-releasing it yourself. Okay. Uh, now, if you, so if you use a uh, convenience method to get an object and you need that object to persist beyond the end of the next event loop or whenever the next pool is drained, you need to send it a retain. So if you find yourself calling convenience methods and then retaining, you probably just wanted to use alloc init instead. Another problem that uh, we need to deal with, with what we've learned so far, <coughs> is, is this kind of thing. Now, each of these uh, blobs represents an object. So we see the object kind of in the middle there has a retain count of two. And the reason is because there are two different things that own it, the thing at the top and the thing at the bottom. Now what happens if the top object uh, is finished with and it goes away? Well, our retain count for the middle object there goes down to one. Uh, but now there's no outside pointers pointing to any of these objects. So these objects are still allocated from the heap. The memory is still tied up. And let's imagine the object on the right there was uh, holding onto a five megabyte image file or something like that. That could be a lot of memory. But um, there's no way to reach this, this memory. So w this memory is leaked, we've lost it. And that's called a retain cycle. So how can we deal with retain cycles? Well, the answer is that child objects should never have a uh, retain on parent objects. Uh, and so if you need a child object to have a pointer to a parent object, you do that with what's called a weak reference, which is a, just a pointer that's unretained. So if you're using properties, that's an assigned property. Does everyone know about properties? So yeah, properties are uh, a way of getting the compiler to synthesize getter and setter methods for your the IVARs in your object. So an assigned property uh, will synthesize a setter method that simply assigns your pointer in, of your IVAR to the value passed in. The alternative would be a uh, retain property, 
and that would be the synthesized setter method would, would contain a retain and uh, therefore you would need to release the object. Uh, so you need to design your program so that it doesn't try to use pointers to parent objects after those parent objects have disappeared and you can only achieve that by designing your code so that it somehow knows not to do that. Uh, now w one thing you can do there is you can set your child pointer to nil when your parent object goes away. If you send a release message to a pointer that's set to nil, that will just do nothing. So you can, you can safely do that. All right, so let's put all we've learned together and create a queue data type. So queues are slightly different from stacks and a queue, the first thing in is the first thing to go out uh, and we'll implement a queue. Here's our first stab at a queue implementation. Uh, we're using an NS mutable array to store the data, which makes it really easy to implement our queue. Uh, so for memory management, what do we need to do here? Does anyone want to have a go at uh, what we need to do in init? No one? All right. Uh, well, that's right. So we've received the array with a um, convenience method. So it doesn't contain alloc or new. So we need to retain it. So what does that mean? We need, it. we need to release it. So we need to create a dialloc method and release our mutable array when our queue goes away. Uh, do we need to do anything in, in queue? Well, it turns out we don't because uh, the mutable array will retain anything put into it. So we can leave the mutable array to take care of that. But when we dequeue an object, that's not so easy. So what we're doing there is we're taking the object out of the mutable array and then we're returning it. So when we take it out, the mutable array will release it. And if that means that the retain count for the object that we took out goes down to zero, then the object will be deallocated before we return it. So we need to retain it and we need to auto-release it because we acquired ownership. And that's our queue implementation. All right, so now we can move on to garbage collection. Uh, now, garbage collection is kind of interesting. If you uh, hang around Objective-C for a while, you'll s be sure to come across someone like this, someone who's a Java programmer or a C-sharp programmer or something like that, and whines about the fact <coughs> that in iOS you don't get garbage collection, you can't have it. And this is a quote from uh, the UK Guardian website less than two weeks ago, so it's still happening. Um, but we do have garbage collection for Mac apps in uh, Lion and Snow Leopard, so let's have a look at how it works. So the garbage collector takes care of all your object management for you. Um, and the way it works is that there is a collector that sits in the background and every now and again, it's kind of unpredictable when it happens, it will scan uh, your heap and it starts with pointers on, the st on your stack and uh, pointers in global variables and it scans all of them following pointers to find every object that is reachable. And uh, what it does then is it says, okay, I know all the objects that are still reachable, so anything that's not reachable must no longer be desired, therefore all of those things can be deallocated. And it deallocates them. Uh, so you don't need to worry about retain cycles with the garbage collection because all the objects in the retain cycle will by definition be no longer reachable uh, from the starting points, so the garbage collector will know that they can all be deallocated. You activate uh, garbage collection by using this uh, command line argument to the compiler, and this is how you pass that command line argument in uh, Xcode 4. So you basically go into your build settings for your project or your target, and just, just type in garbage in this little search box there and you'll find Objective-C garbage collection and you can use the drop down menu to select the uh, option there. There's another option, the F, uh, F obj C GC only says that I only work with garbage collection. There's another option that kind of lets you work with garbage collected and reference counted st stuff. But uh, unless you really know what you're doing, you, you're never gonna wanna use that. Okay, uh, so if you need to allocate non-object memory and you want the garbage collector to manage it for you, you don't call malloc, you call this thing called NS Allocated Collectible. 
and you need to declare your pointer strong, so underscore underscore strong, because otherwise the collector will regard any non-object pointer as weak, and what that means is it doesn't follow it, so therefore the memory area that that, that pointer points to is not regarded as reachable, so the garbage collector will clean it up. Now, if you needed to allocate an array of arrays, and those things need to be collectible as well, you do that with by adding ns scanned option to the, as the second argument to ns allocate collectible there. So that's uh, that's how you allocate an array of arrays and have those managed as well. Okay, uh, if you need to do last minute cleanup in your object, you don't use dealloc, you use finalize, and there's there's an example. It's pretty much exactly like dialloc except it's called finalize. But remember, you don't need to release any IVARs anymore, so you probably won't find yourself needing to write too many finalize methods. OK, so the advantage to garbage collection is obviously developer ease. It's really easy to write uh, all your code when you don't have to manage memory. That reduces your code size by a lot, and uh, memory bugs are really annoying, hard to find, hard to fix. So this makes your life a lot easier. But it comes at a price. There are some disadvantages. First of all, obviously, it's not available in iOS. Uh, second, uh, the collector kicks in. You, you never quite know when the collector is going to kick in. You can send it a hint that now might be a good time, but it's not guaranteed to obey that hint. And it will just kick in when it feels like it needs to. And when it does, scanning your heap uh, is a pretty intensive operation. So your program will quite possibly have little hiccups in it where uh, the garbage collector kicks in and the user will be able to notice sometimes that the garbage collector is working and they'll see that as kind of stuttering in your app. Uh, and the other problem that has, happens is that garbage builds up between collections so the high watermark of your application's memory usage will be larger with garbage collection because garbage builds up and then it finally gets cleaned up. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have the developer ease of garbage collection and none of these disadvantages? And fortunately, we can. And we've arrived at part four, automatic reference counting. This is available now in Clang. If you want to get Clang, uh, that's at clang.llvm.org. But that, that's replacing your compiler front end and stuff. So that's probably a bit too much hassle. Just wait for the uh, next version of Xcode, which is probably going to be out pretty soon. Uh, it, will it will work for Mac apps and iOS apps. Uh, and how it works is that the compiler figures out where all your retain and release and auto release calls need to go and sticks them in there for you so you can forget about them, which is pretty nice. Um, it does not do anything other than object management. So if you have malloc memory or file pointers or something like that, you need to deal with them yourself. Um, and that's the argument to turn it on. Uh, now, Xcode 4.2 is still under NDA, so I've kind of not wanted to include anything about Xcode 4.2 on my slides. Uh, but you can assume that there will be an option, kind of like there was with garbage collection, for turning it on. Uh, now. My understanding is that by default, all new projects in Xcode 4.2 will be ARC enabled. Uh, but if you have an old project that you want to import in, there will be a migration tool in Xcode 4.2, which will scan through all your code and uh, figure out everything it needs to do to it will basically remove all your retains and releases and auto releases for you and turn your code into ARC code. Uh, so if we go back to our queue implementation, and look at how it would look uh, if we were using automatic reference counting. So first up, we don't need to retain the array anymore because the arc will add the retain for us. And that means we don't need a dialloc method anymore because arc will do the release for us. And same with the object we're getting out of the uh, uh, mutable array there. We don't need to retain it, and therefore we don't need to auto-release it. Now, what does this look like? The original. The original, that's right. This is exactly how we wrote it before we worried about memory management. OK, now a trick uh, with auto-release pools uh, in Arc, instead of creating an auto-release pool object, it's now a language feature. So you just declare an auto-release pool compound statement like that. Um, now one trick you may see, sometimes people do something like this. They create an auto-release pool, and 
instead of uh, draining that pool every time through the loop, they drain it every fourth time or something like that. Uh, so that way they reduce the high watermark of their app's memory usage without incurring a, the expense of a, drain, a pool drain every time through the loop. Now, um, you, you can't do this kind of trickery with Arc, uh, and the migration tool won't know how to deal with this, so you'll have to fix this. It will throw up a, a thing about how it doesn't know how to deal with this, and you'll have to fix it. And the way you fix it is just by not, not doing that trick. You just do what you saw in the previous slide, just do an auto-release pool compound statement. Another feature of Arc is zeroing weak references. And here's some examples of how you declare a weak reference. And the trick with Arc is that when, a, when the uh, object a weak reference points to is deallocated, the weak reference will be set to nil automatically for you. You don't even, you don't even know it's happening. It's just, just done behind the scenes for you. Uh, so that means you don't need to worry about retain cycles. So here's our retain cycle again, but because the a reference from the bottom object there is a weak reference, the retain count of the middle object is only one, not two. So that means when the first object goes away, that, that object's retain count hits zero, which means it goes away, and the weak reference transparently gets changed to nil, which means our other objects go away, so our retain cycle is solved. Okay, so the final part of our talk today is uh, tools for hunting and killing memory bugs. And uh, the best way I can uh, demonstrate them is with a demo. So we'll do that. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is instruments. Has anyone used instruments before? Yeah, a few couple of people. They're pretty, very cool, really. I, I, I think they're just amazing. Especially I, I started developing, as I said, on those 8-bit machines. <laughs> Tools like this are just incredible. Uh, so I've got an example um, program here. This is called Cortex Arc uh, something or other. Arc Cocoa, yeah. It's a sample program that you can download from Apple's uh, developer site. And I'll just quickly show you what it does. Uh, what, it, it, what it does is it uh, draws text in an arc. So it's a demonstration of how to draw text in an arc. Hopefully it will come up at some point. Okay, so th there's what it, what it looks like. Um, now I've, I've added a memory leak to this, this program. It doesn't come with a memory leak. <laughs> I've added it. And we're going to see if we can figure out how to find it. So first of all, I'll shrink my uh, Xcode window here. Yeah. This doesn't want to work. All right, I won't bother. So the way you launch instruments to, uh, to analyze your app is by selecting profile from the product menu. So this will compile your app and then uh, launch it in instruments so you can use instruments to analyze your app. Okay, so there's our, um, oh, that's not gonna work. This is the launch screen for um, instruments. Get that out of the way. So you've got a bunch of options on this left here of different instruments you can use to analyze your program, but the one we're interested in is leaks. So we'll start that up. So it's launched our pro or it's launching our program and analyzing its memory usage as we go. So if we go back into instruments here and click on leaks, we see we've got some leaks here. Uh, and the little chart here shows you how, how much memory you're leaking and stuff. All right, so if we want to look at um, the leaked memory and figure out where it's coming from. You can click on this little arrow here, or an easier way is to click this thing. This uh, shows you a stack trace of the, where the memory that was leaked was allocated. And you can use this slider to get more or less detail. But you'll notice that uh, all the methods that are part of system classes are grayed out a bit so that your methods are easier to see. So here's, here's a method in the actu our actual code. Uh, and that's where the allocated memory was leaked, or was created. The memory that was leaked was created. So if we double click on that, we get taken to see the source for the, uh, the call that allocated the memory. 
uh, I don't know how easy that is to see, but there's a little Xcode icon right there. And if you click on that, it will take you straight to the code. So it's amazingly cool. So who wants to guess what we've done wrong here? That's right. We needed to auto-release uh, attribute string. So if I add that in, and then we can quit instruments. And then if we start it up again, Now we see there's no leaks. Okay, so that's how do you find memory leaks with instruments. There's lots of other very cool instruments in instruments, so I highly recommend checking that out. All right, the other tool I wanted to show you is Guard Malloc. So I'll load that up. So I've created a little toy project here uh, that has three different kinds of memory problems. And I'll demonstrate how you can use Guard Malloc and things like it to, to find them. Okay, so we'll run our program without any uh, memory analysis and see what happens with problem one. Now that's totally invisible, isn't it? Uh, oops. All right. Sorry? This one? Ah, okay, cool. Uh, it hasn't shown what I wanted for some reason. Let's try it again. Okay, so the output at the moment is this string is greater, is bigger than the buffer allocated for it. But you'll notice that the, the program didn't crash. There's no error, error message or anything like that. So how can we find problems like this? And uh, what you can do is you can go into Edit Scheme. If you click on the Run step here, get that out of the way, and then turn on Guard Malloc. And then if we run our program then, uh, you'll see that now our code has actually crashed. We get a bunch of uh, error messages here, and uh, we can see where the problem is. And now, the way it works is Guard Malloc is a different version of the Malloc library, and uh, it does a whole bunch of extra, extra things to try and make your program crash when you do something wrong. And so it's worked here. So, if we, so, so that's, that's how to find problems like that if you're writing into buffers that are too small for what you're writing into them. So that's Guard Malloc. All right, we'll look at the second problem here. So I'll quickly turn off Guard Malik and run this one. Okay, so in this one we read some freed memory. And if you look at the output there, you can see that it, it worked. We didn't have any problem even though we freed the memory. So what happens with this kind of bug is that you'll free the memory. It'll work sometime really shortly after that. But then sometime later in your program's execution, you'll start to have problems. So how can we find these problems early on? Uh, so a trick is if we go into Edit Scheme again, and this time we'll turn on malloc scribble. And what that does is when you free a block of memory, it writes throughout that block of memory a, a specific value. So if we uh, run our program again, you can see we get use. So that that's a hex value 55 is basically written into every byte of your freed block uh, so that you notice sooner uh, when this kind of problem happens. So that's problem two. And the last problem is problem three. Uh, so we'll turn off scribble and run it. So this time we do get a crash. And what's happened is uh, we've tried to free memory that's already been freed. Now, in a toy program like this, I mean, it's really easy to figure out where buffer gets freed uh, for the first time. 
But uh, I once had to work on an open source program that was really huge and complicated. And it had an annoying problem, which was it was trying to free memory that had already been freed. And I just had absolutely no idea where that memory was getting allocated or where it was getting freed the first time around because it was getting stuck into containers and moved around all over the place and stuff. So it's really hard to figure out that bug. But there's a tool we can use here. Oops. Um, so we enable stack logging. Okay, so if we now run this with stack logging, uh, oops, stop. So we get an error message here, um, similar to what we got before, saying that this pointer is being freed twice. But because stack logging is running, what we can do is we can start up the terminal. And we can use a, method, a program called malloc history. So you need two bits of information to work with malloc history. One of them is the process ID uh, of the process. And the other one is the address of the memory location that you're worried about. So I'll just copy, and copy that out. So we go malloc history 64 is the process ID. Excuse me. <coughs> and that's the memory location. That prints out a lot of information, but what we're interested in is near the top. So we'll pipe that through more. And what we see here is here's, that, here's our address that we we're interested in and it gets allocated in some function. And it gets freed in some other function. So now we know where it got created and where it got freed, so we can uh, debug our, uh, our app. And that's uh, malloc history. All right, so that's our uh, debugging tools. Uh, oops. Is that a safe tool or a That'll work for both, yeah. Um, okay, and that concludes the talk. So thank you very much. <laughs>